Talk of the Trollway spotlights Mount Horeb, Wisconsin's unique artists, entertainers, hobbyists, and personalities. Funding for Talk of the Trollway is provided by Miller and Sons Supermarket. With a serious work ethic and a whimsical eye, clay artist Michael Kelly is inspired by the everyday things in the world around him. In his 4th Street studio, he gives his imagination free reign as he creates his sculptures, teaches several classes, and experiments with new ideas. On this episode of Talk of the Trollway, Michael describes his approach to the creative process and explains how his ideas have a tendency to grow on one another, like the medallions here on the old co-op building in downtown Mount Horeb. I'm your host, Gary Schutz. I started working with clay in high school. Okay. You know, here in Mount Horeb. A lot of potter's wheel stuff. Um, I think I probably even started my sculptural stuff way back then. But projects, you know, when you're in school you do project. So I dabbled in a lot of different things. You know, a little bit of pottery, a little bit of sculpture. I, I didn't want to approach clay that way, you okay. know. I think college teaches you that too. I think any program that's worth its weight teaches you that there's not one legitimate approach to clay, that you can approach clay in a lot of different ways. So where did you graduate from college? UW-Madison, and then I went and after that, I went and got a master's degree from Washington University in St. Louis. So I went through all academia. What drew you to St. Louis? Um, I got in. <laughs> <laughs> I was waitlisted a couple different places, and I think by the time I finished up at UW Madison, I was I was ready to go. I didn't want to sit around and wait for a year or two years until I got into these other programs, and you know, WashU accepted me right out of undergrad. Okay. So that influenced the decision. What did you have to do to earn that master's degree? Uh, well, you have to do a, a, a senior show. You have okay. to do a thesis show. As, as part of a group, a group show. And then you, know, you have to sit in front of your boards and you have to talk about your work and you know, talk about what you were doing. And it's all, it's all pretty heady stuff, you know. It's not, uh, not pretty blue collar, for lack of a better word, you know. Sure. It's all pretty academic and it sort of fits in that college niche. You have to be able to talk about your stuff. Do you still have any of those pieces? <laughs> oh, sure. There's some in my yard. There's still probably some here if I look around. And so, and then after St. Louis, did you move back to Mount Horeb? No, prior to that, we moved to, I was renting studio space with an artist out in Mineral Point. Okay. A pretty well-known guy, his name is Bruce Howdle, does these great big murals, and he's a well-known ceramic guy. I rented from him for a year and a half. And then at that time, after a year and a half, my wife got a job um, on campus at UW-Madison. Okay. So we just needed to move closer. And, you know, I moved back here and I rented a, a space downtown. Um, the old feed mill. Next to the old feed Next mill. Next to the old feed mill, okay. Right, right. It was also a cheese, it was a cheese, part of the riser cheese buildings down okay. there. The building is still there. It's, some of my work's on it and stuff. All right. But, so I rented that place for a couple of years. Okay. And then the building was up for sale and, you know, I didn't kind of want, I didn't want that hanging over my head because I, I don't know. If, if it was going to sell or how soon it would sell. Sure. So then we decided to take the plunge and build this place. I'm very, very lucky. This is, I'm very, very fortunate. You know, and I like to tell people too when they come in here is that this didn't happen overnight. You know, they come in and they get, especially fellow artists, fellow clay people, they get a little, you know, oh, this is so great. But then I have to, I want to make it clear and be humble <laughs> about it that this didn't happen. You know, I didn't spend 30 years as a, something and then decide to throw all this money at it, you know. Sure. It's, it, my career has been very, uh, it has not, hasn't been revolutionary, it's been evolutionary. I like that way to think of it. You know, it's just How happened, do you mean? It's happened it's like slow and gradual rather than, you know, I didn't, sudden, I'm not like a sudden hit, you know, or something like that. Okay. If that can happen in the air, it can happen in the air yeah. world, but not in the clay world, that's for certain. Right after graduate school, I was really interested in architecture. Okay. I was interested in, uh, you know, like windows and columns and all these sort of architectural elements. And I wanted to include those pieces, those elements in my work. All right. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So I used to do these little sculptures. I called them dwelling pieces. They were basically little, I hate the word, houses. You know, these little stacked houses. Mm -hmm. And I always made them kind of off kilter. You know, so they kind of leaned one direction or the other. Or they didn't look quite stable. All right. Sure. So that's how I made those pieces. 
And then after graduate school, when you're out sort of in the world, they say, you know, work like that wasn't selling. So I took that idea of the dwellings and I made them, I inserted clock faces into them. I thought to myself, this would be cool. And maybe I even saw it somewhere. I don't care. I got this idea like, you know, I can put a clock face in my dwellings. Sure. So that led to a series of these clocks that kind of lean in different directions with architectural elements like roofs and just stuff carved into these pieces. All right? Sure. So then that, these individual single pieces led to groups of them, like groups of stacked houses. Like a neighborhood. Like a neighborhood, exactly right. And I called those urban pileups. I like know? that. And I, I got a lot of mileage out of that. You know, I really milked that for, a, a, you know, for what it was worth. Urban pileups are generated from your interest in architecture and yeah. those sorts of forms and lines. Mm -hmm. Where were you pulling those images from? Were you pulling them from Mineral Point or books that you've seen or places that you've been? Where, where were those buildings that you were creating here influenced from? Prob probably everything you just said, man. All of that stuff, I believe. You know, okay. all that stuff, you know, reads in either directly or indirectly or subconsciously or consciously into the work, you know? Have you seen a progression in things? Have you seen um, influences from your previous art showing up? Oh, absolutely. Any artist who's worth his his or her weight notes that you sort of you build off an idea you're saying and things just there's, there's so many ways you could go with things and one idea leads to the next idea and the next idea and the next idea and I don't know if it's always that linear for artists but for me I, I see that all the time that I have this idea and I, I build on it and I'll do a series and then maybe I'll come back to it and revisit it but everything is just sort of built like a building blocks, I guess. I'm a sucker for craftsmanship. I like something that's put together well, and I like to think that my work is, is put together really well. You know, because there's some, you know, there's some pretty hard, fast rules when you're working with clay. The clay has to dry out slow. You can't fire it too quickly. You have to make sure that the clay is completely dry before you put it in the kiln. So there's some, there's some really finite rules about that, you know, as a craftsmanship as a craftsman or whatever, you have to know how to work with your material, you know? Mm -hmm. But the happy accidents that you're referring to can take place during glazing. You know, glaze can run or drip a different way, or depending on how you fire it, it can... And I like that, I like that, those, those accidents like that. You know, and some, some potters or clay artists, they, they, wanna, they, they wanna remove that element from their work altogether. They want everything to be down, have everything completely, you know, so, so precise, which is great for them and ends up looking cool pieces, but my approach to clay, I don't, you know, I'm not after that, that tight of process. I don't want to control the whole process that way. It leads me back to that whimsical comment. I suppose. You know what? If it happens, it happens. Yeah. It's Aside from when you, you don't want to build a piece that's going to crumble or fall apart. Absolutely. Or a potter who throws right. a big chunky pot. You know, you want to be, you know, want to have your craft down. Sure. You know? But it seems to me you've gotten to the point where you're past that and you can work into those happy Yeah, you know, things. I think so. And maybe that's just experience, man. It's like sure. um, the, the more time you work with clay, the gap, you know, we haven't talked about this too, and I, this is maybe a leftover college phrase, but it's so they always say that vision is ahead of execution. Your vision for a piece is always much far, farther apart from the actual piece. You know what I mean? So I think, and maybe this is, I sound like a canned ham here, but it's like the more experience you have with a material, that gap between vision and what you actually create, I think, narrows. You can, add, you can answer specific questions about process. A piece of clay needs to be fired, right? Yep. You know, a painter needs to use oils or acrylics or whatever they use. They need to brush it on. So, so those are concrete questions, but when you're trying to, you know, nail a you try to get me to articulate like what's going on in my head when I'm in the middle of making a piece. That's for me anyway, that's kind of difficult to articulate. Well, the one example right now is the piece that you saw me working on earlier is this new, it's not new, but my landscape series. And that's very much influenced by driving around in the country looking at like this time of year when the farmers are cutting their fields and you see all those, those hay. You know, the contour lines. Right, the contour lines, all those beautiful, I guess they do it in the, the spring too when they plant. You know, all those beautiful lines that are like rolling and meandering through, you know, that's what I want to, 
I, you know, I want to emulate that or talk about that in this landscape series. I was at an art fair in Minneapolis and the potter next to me, a great guy from Lake Mills, he did work, he had these tiles and I really dug them. I went over and talked to him and I was like, hey, and he told me where he, so I didn't, you know, he gave me the idea. I said, hey, Michael, why don't you start, because you know, I was curious about him. And he said, hey, why don't you start using these lampshades? You know, so he gave me the idea and you go to Menard and you spend 12 bucks and you get a dozen of these things and you start laying clay and playing with them and carving and doing different things. Experimenting. Right, right. Yeah. It's totally random. I just, I just place them on the, the form, the, the light shade that you saw me working with. I just sort of place them on there random, you know, and I don't want to, I don't overthink it. I don't like, oh, I'm going to have this one close to this one. I'm just, I'm just putting them on there, man. And then I'm put, you know, draping the clay over it, taking my sponge and smoothing it out. Getting those those what do you call them? Um, the, the contour lines. The contour lines, topography, as you said. I'm just topography. Yeah, that's good. But I'm just I'm smoothing it out and like um, just making sure that you can see those big bumps. You know, those big sure what kind of represent mounds to me or the landscape around here. And I just kind of follow like up the hill and down the hill and around. I just kind of roll and just just carve in. Just let the carving. I don't know, man. Just carve. I carry my journal with me all the time. That's a habit that I started way back as an undergrad at UW-Madison. I'm sure. constantly writing things in there, things that I want to try. You know, and there's a lot of great clay work around here and a lot of clay work everywhere that I look at and all that stuff kind of influences me. And my surroundings, where I'm in, what I'm looking at, and, you know, by admiring and looking at other artists' work, you know. It doesn't have to be clay work either. I mean, there's a lot of great fiber artists out there, painters. I love landscapes, you know. I love landscape paintings, real stylized, you know, landscapes. What I'd like to do, there's this term, I don't, I don't know if I pronounce it, it's called plain air painting, where these painters go out and actually paint in their environment. There's artists here like Larry Whalow out in um, Blue Mounds. Sure. And another guy named Chris Gargan. And anyway, these painters that go out and paint in the environment. And what I thought would be cool is if I could do that with clay. Take my clay out there and set it up on an easel and carve landscapes much like they paint. But anyway, I just thought it'd be kind of a fun, maybe that's the next thing. My, my next thing might be to do that much like in the style of a plein air painter, you know? Sure. Take my clay out and slap it on an easel and, and carve some of those lines and some of those things into them. Has Mount Horeb influenced your work in any other ways? You know, I did a commission here in Mount Horeb for a local businessman. You, you mentioned the old feed mill. There's some mm -hmm. of my work. There's seven large architectural murals sure. up on the old feed mill. And if you look close at those pieces, there's seven of them, but I went through and I walked through the village of Mount Hora a number of years ago. I think they've been up here like, those have been there maybe 11 or 12 years ago I did that commission. Um, I just took various sort of architectural elements from the buildings here in Mount Hora and I incorporated them into those seven pieces up on the building. I like, I like being here. I really do. I like providing, you know, classes for, you know, the community, the kids. Yeah, whatever. What do you think would happen if I took the kiln piece out of a kiln too quick? Uh, it would explode. From the air it wouldn't, pressure. It wouldn't explode. From the air temperature. You're on the right track. It would cool it, too fast and then crack. Exactly. It wouldn't blow up, but it would crack. It makes like a bird noise. Uh, Dixon, dude. Dixon, that's good. I was hoping you'd make that whole thing brown. It makes like a bird noise. You know, something cool for kids to do, you know? You know, I like that. I'm proud of that. I like to have these my objects in my yard, my yard sculptures. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, I get a lot of, it might be kind of cheesy, but I get a lot of attention for having these, you know, these sculptures in my yard. And I love doing those because I don't have to worry about selling them. You know, it just sort of meets this niche I have to create something with other materials. And a lot of the wood that you see in those pieces came from when we built the studio. We had to cut down some big, beautiful trees. When we bought the house 12 years ago, I met this other artist who had um, this bowling ball sculpture it was a pyramid. It was like this eight foot tall pyramid with bowling balls, you know, loosely stacked. I don't even think he used any mortar or whatever. So I had that idea, I got the idea from him and I wanted to do that. You know, I knew that if I ever had, I don't even think we owned a house then, but I always wanted to try that idea. And that, so that's how it started, right? So I started collecting all these bowling balls and people would leave them on my front porch and I started collecting them all and then I, and then I did the math, again with the math, and I realized how many bowling balls you need to create a 10 feet sculpture. With, it's a lot. And so I had to think of cr other creative ways to use 
the, the bowling ball bags and, the, and the, ball, the bowling balls themselves. I like to put up, you know, every once in a while I like to add a new piece to the front yard or if one, because they're not our carvel, whatever the word is, they're not built to last by any means. You know, and slowly the wood will crumble and I'll have to replace it with a different piece. If I find something that's kind of groovy and I want to put it in the piece, I'll do that. I'm sure it drives my neighbor nuts, but he already thinks I'm crazy, so. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you've, uh, how, how do you plan ahead to incorporate, I'm going to call it found materials, into your sculptures? And that's a leftover graduate school too. You know, when I, my first year of graduate school, I was combining a lot of different materials into my clay and doing things like wooden clay and adding glass and different things. And I've, that's, that has carried through in some of my work even today. It looks like they're different like subsets of your work. Found materials don't go through the kiln. No, no, they're added later. They're added later. Yeah. Right. I have played around with melting glass in pieces. How'd that um, work out? Pretty cool. It's, it's a little bit of a, like, a, it's called slumping, or well, I call it slumping. Um, I've done a little bit of that, and then I, asked, I added, like, crushed glass to a couple pieces of my tiles. And it's kind of cool. Does the art drive the finding, or does the found piece drive the art? Oh man, probably the latter. I don't know. I find a cool piece of metal and I'm like, I wonder what it would look like if I combine this with the clay. It sounds like you find a piece and that sparks an idea for you. Yeah, yeah. Which may go back to that previous question of... Well, you, answered, you answered it for me there, Gary. I mean, that's exactly right. I find a piece... I was on a scooter ride the other day. I found this beautiful piece of metal. I don't know what the heck it is. And I haven't used it in a piece of clay yet. It sits over in my gallery area there. But I'm, one of these days, I'm going to combine it with clay. Okay. I don't know what yet, but I know it's a beautiful piece of rusted metal and I'll use it eventually. Do you want to be remembered as a great artist? I just want to, you know, I want to be skilled at what I do. I want to be a good craftsman. I want to have people respond to my work. I want to have people want what I create to become, that's a really compliment. When someone wants something you make to become part of their environment, whether it's utilitarian, whether you're making a mug they can drink about, drink out of every day, or a beautiful piece on the wall. When they want that to become part of their environment, that's a real kick in the pants, you know? I, I, tr I really try not to take myself too seriously. <laughs> Next time on Talk of the Trollway, we raise a glass with Alan Fitzgerald winemaker at Mount Horb's Fisher King Winery as he explains the nuances, good and bad, of crafting wine in Wisconsin. I'm your host, Gary Schutz. Talk of the Trollway is a production of Mount Horeb, Wisconsin's Village Cable Station, Trollway TV. Funding for Talk of the Trollway is provided by Miller & Sons Supermarket. Talk of the Trollway is on Facebook, where your comments and story ideas are welcome.